you could get started. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome again to our match, match version of the Al Two meeting update. Um, hope everybody's kind of staying safe and staying protected from all this pandemic. Um, today's supposed to hopefully be a short meeting. It shouldn't be too long. Give everybody a chance to take off early for match break. <laughs> But I want to remind everybody that um, the meeting is recorded, so just be careful what you say. Um, yeah, we are really happy today. We have a few trainees, so I'm really, really excited because, you know, they're the ones who make things happen, usually, in life, so welcome. Um, you know, and so we're going to get some excellent update from the trainees. Um, with regards to the agenda, just to remind everyone. Oops. Okay, so I'm going to again just reorient everyone in terms of some current updates where things are with some of the scale-ups and stuff. We're going to get an update from Jean Fu and Alex and his team on the latest and greatest um, pharmacology that's going on. And then we're going to get an, a nice presentation from um, one of our trainees, Mehat Sani. She's been doing a lot of BBB penetration studies with some of the compounds that we have, and now since if you sort of anticipate a CWP like DIPG might at some point require combination, one of the chronic problems is that a lot of these compounds don't penetrate the brain. That's why they're not effective. And so she's doing some nice studies and some models for brain penetration. So we'll see some update from some of the work she's doing. And then um, the, a team from Max um, who is training on doing a lot of IP analysis, they have done a nice overview of um, the freedom to operate status of the series that we are advancing. It's actually important to actually keep, keep an eye on the IP scope so that nobody can actually prevent us from advancing any of these compounds. So we're going to get some update on some of the work that some of the trainees have done in just doing an IP analysis of the compound status today. So we're looking forward to that. And then, as I say, it's going to be a short meeting, so we're going to have almost over an hour for discussion if there's any burning issues to discuss. Okay. Um, with regards to current updates, so again, we are scaling up the compounds. So we know 2009 has been scaled um, by GL Chemtech. They have also delivered to 117. We have about 45 grams of it. But apparently, they, they have had some hiccup with delivering 2163. They did mention they had a few little challenges with the chemistry, but they were going to revisit that and get back to us. So that has been delayed, and 2163 is one of our more important compounds. But gladly, um, David Smill, one of the chemists here, have actually stepped up and taken on the task of making enough quantity so that we can initiate some of the, the, the efficacy studies that we want to look at. So thanks to David for actually doing that. He has now synthesized over four grams of 2160 as the HCL salt, ready to go for study. So thanks, David, for really doing that for the team. Um, and again, we knew the two amides, the 2234 and 2236, they were always delayed because of one of the starting material that had to be you know, imported. Okay, so I think we're in a good place in terms of having compounds to really initiate some of these studies you're going to see in the second bullet point. Now, one of the key for the project is we really, really want to show some efficacy in a preclinical models to kind of facilitate some of the, you know, the development aspects for the program. Um, so right now, just to remind everyone, um, Chris Jones and Deanna, at ICR, they they have looked into the Owen model, they have developed that model. We have provided them with 2009. It's an orthotopic model, and they have just initiated, um, you know, dosing in that model. So in the next couple of weeks, we are hoping to start getting some updates as to how 2009 is doing in this new model. Okay, we are venturing in new grounds. Um, again, I mentioned thanks to David, he made some 2163. Um, Angel in Spain, he has actually tested 2009 in his model, and he has always been interested in testing one of the more potent compounds that he had observed, which is 2163. So that's why we were so anxious on getting 2163 scaled. Now we have it in hand, it's ready to ship to Angle, and so he's going to be happy to get that study started. 
He had initiated getting mice because this model, orthotopic model, takes almost 70 days to actually get the tumor to be developed before they start dosing. So we're glad to see now that we have enough to 16G to get that study started. Um, and finally, Nada Jabado, I mean, she's also looking at some of the DIPG models and one of the nice things, she has developed this sub -Q version of a DIPG model which has been very challenging. Normally, you know, a lot of these, um, you know, patient-derived tumors, when people try to grow them under the skin, they just don't grow. And so whatever magic she has tried, she has managed to get, you know, two DIPG tumors, the DIPG-4 and the DIPG-36. She managed to get those go under the skin. And so the xenograph model is going to be a shorter model. It's about two to three weeks, just like a typical xeno. So that's going to be excited to see. She's trying this for the first time. We have provided her 2009, and she has started doing um, a sub Q model of DIPD. So we are looking forward to some in vivo updates to just see how a lot of these new models are coming. In the meantime, we continue to just try and understand and some of these DIPG lines and the mechanism of BMP signaling and how ALTO might be playing a role in those. And um, Charles, we will continue to do some of the back of chemistry. I just want to always, I'm the broken record, mm -hmm. the concept of searching for a model that happens to work mm -hmm. is like really ass backwards, isn't it? Mm -hmm. in terms of, yeah, we know, we know right? that. Yeah, just putting it out there for the young people. Here's, yeah. the, here's the thing where we, there's no model, so yeah. we're going to find, we're going to, <laughs> I know. It works. It's and then we'll declare victory. It's like I know. completely weird. I know. It's driving us crazy too, but you want me to do my broken record? <laughs> I, I know. Sorry, that is a one of that, that, that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I just, it's the best tool we have. I know, yeah. yeah. And so therefore, we're a bunch of tools. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you and I will long be gone before this is involved. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, this is sitting steady for the rest. Okay. We're recording. <laughs> okay, and then now uh, I thought I'd just, you know, so this was some data generated by Diana, just to remind people like 2009 and 2016, in some of these in which cell models, she has generated some IC50, just to know that the compounds are active, and I just wanted to remind people 2163. Consistently is always more potent than 2009. That's why we are so excited in seeing that one in an in vivo model. And then I just want to also remind the team so, for the IP analysis that you're going to see from some of the kids, these are the five leads that we have actually selected. I've highlighted the ones that we're really prioritizing because of the high CNS penetrant properties. So, 2117, 2009, and 2163. The other two compounds, they're clean in her, but they're actually less penetrant. So. They're actually on the low priorities for now, but and now um, again as I continue to do um the competitive landscape searches, I mean so nothing new has come on board um, in terms of other companies advancing anything. So all we know of is Toliero. Um is the only company that we know have a small molecule. But, um, you know, Nada and her group have actually shown that that compound might have multiple mechanisms. It's not really, you know, going through the ALTO. And so the other companies like Blueprint, BioQuist, and Kairos, they have ALTO programs, but they're going after FOP. They're not really focusing on the CNS penetrant aspect of the disease. So we can actually be pioneers in terms of, you know, if you get an ALTO compound that works in the clinic, it's going to be one of the first small, small molecules. Uh, this is Jungfu from SGC Oxford. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering whether um, uh, Angel has done any um, phosphosmart staining on um, his his fixed mice uh, mice brains. What, what kind of staining is? Uh, phosphosmart one. Phosphosmart? No, no, yeah. he didn't do any phosphosmart. I mean, he's sending some brain samples to us from the efficacy studies. So those will be shipped. They haven't gotten here yet. So we're going to have samples, I think, soon from his study. I so I don't know. We will so so we will you, you we are can. planning to check for the phosphorylation of smart one type in those brain um, tissues? 
Yeah, we're going to get brain slices and stuff. So yeah, Ahmed, Ahmed is here. So he just gave um, Angel the shipping info. Mm -hmm. So he is, he's shipping them. When they get here, we can actually design a plan. What is the plan for the uh, sample when you receive them? So the uh, initial plan was to look at the compounds. In mm -hmm. the brain. That's, the, uh, that's the idea. Of, that's what we wanted to do. But we don't. I don't need the whole brain to do that. I can spare some if someone wants to do it. Yeah. Be because I'm thinking that would be a good indicator of um, EV4, at least that it's reaching the target and inhibiting the output in the brain. So, mm -hmm. I mean, um, there's a cap capacity to do it here as well for the uh, paraffin sectioning and staining. So, if, if like, that's an option. So, yeah. Okay. So, do you think, you think Richard, um, Tim, they can, like, is, is easy... Um, Them guys are not overwhelmed. So, I mean, and they probably have the antibodies and stuff already. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, so you think you guys can help out in doing the phosphosmart analysis for this? So yeah. when the samples yeah, come? Yeah, that, that definitely because uh, the antibody is really good. Yes, okay, okay. that's not well, a bad idea. Well, let's an action item that we yeah. will forward it to can. Alex and we'll go yeah. from there and take what you can. That's okay. Uh, yeah. Sorry, um, it's John for John, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, send it to the team out in Oxford. Yeah, sure. Yeah. That's a very good idea. Okay, great. Okay. Thank Th you. Thanks, John, for yeah. So thank you. Okay. okay. Okay, so if there are no other questions, um, yeah, it's John for up next, so. Uh, whoops. Okay, Yep. So these are some of the essays that uh, of the routine testing that Alison have performed. Has performed, and um, so that they are they are the corresponding uh, nanobread result for the several of the latest compounds from Charles Rivers lab, and then as well as the um, out to dual luciferase uh, orthogonal assay, which is measuring basically the downstream uh, transcription activity, um, mm -hmm. as well as the uh, dual luciferase assay for out five because the nanobread uh, assay is, is working, but then um, we are having a limited amount of the tracer though. So at the moment, we are still relying on the out five dual luciferase assay as a readout for the uh, off target inhibition of out five. And um, actually, encouragingly, um, uh, I, think, I, I think the structure are in the next slide, but uh, M4K3120. Um, our, in our previous meeting, um, Alison has presented it to be really specific to out 2 and also it has like really low um, off-target effect on out 5 And I remember Sue was mentioning that um, in the in vitro, um, the biochemical assay from reaction biology, uh, it seems that the, the significant amount of, like quite high amount of off-target out 5 inhibition but uh, um, Alison has um, repeated the essay and seems to be not the case because uh, it is still consistently showing like no no inhibition basically. Whereas the three one two two is moderately active, and basically all three of them are not active to um, on out five. Yeah, maybe. So I was just looking at the um, the data, the ALK2, the, the biochemical data. So ALK2 was about uh, 13 nanomolar, and ALK5 was 500 nanomolar. So it's still relatively active on ALK5. Mm. So which one was that? Was that 3120? Yeah. 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 That's How come right. it says here? Yeah, the blue one. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it looks the blue on this data looks really nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you're That's saying, Sue, Sue. That's the biochemical. The, the, biochem the biochemical data from reaction biology was um, 13 nanomolar and and 507 nanomolar per hour. I think in, in, a lot more in any case in the biochemical assay. On on our side, we'll be able to at least for the 3120 to use the um, the the precious tracer to at least check it in the corresponding out five uh, nanobread uh, target engagement assay to 
just double double verify yeah. this. I think that that would be a good idea based on that the, the mm -hmm. data from the uh, biochemical assay. So this is this compound is one of the this was the second blueprint patent compound from the second blueprint patent. Um, mm. But if it really does look quite interesting, then we might consider looking at uh, what we might be able to do, what else we might be able to do with that molecule. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What other what other physical characteristics or what characteristics do we know about it other than the, what we've seen here? This is it. Mm -hmm. no, nothing yet, because we didn't follow it up because it wasn't particularly selective from the um, uh, the original data. So. We, we haven't done any more with it at the moment. So does the cellular yeah. assay usually follow the biochemical or is there usually a big drop off? I'm just wondering if we know anything about the KM for the two enzymes and whether that might um, explain the difference. Usually it tends to be the other way around. Mm. The biochemical assay would indicate like a higher potency, mm. whereas in the cellular assay it will be less potent. But yeah, so in this case, it's yeah, in any case, we'll get to testing it in the out five target engagement essay as well soon to just double confirm this. Yeah, that would be good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would be good, yeah. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, I think. Um, so the next is uh, the latest compound that we have gotten from uh, Sue. And uh, it's being cut off at the bottom. But um, in, in any case, um, M4K3127 is, this, is reasonably active as well as 3132 um, uh, in on out 2 but it, for out 5 uh, we are still, uh, Alison is actually still performing the essay, so we will we'll update you all once we get the result. Okay. So I have actually just got the biochemical data back on those, and I think 3127 was about 13 nanomolar in the um, Biochem assay, I didn't get it in time to incorporate it in this, so sorry about that. Mm -hmm. and no, no, no three, I think that all three of those compounds that were active had around 30 or so nanomolar in the biochem assay. Mm -hmm. Actually, on our site, we'll try to get more of the R5. 30. Yes. So. Okay. So, we'll yeah. so uh, over here I'm summarizing like a really uh, broad overview of the uh, effects of the M4K lead compounds um, mm -hmm. uh, in causing the cell death of the IPG um, over time and this is over seven days and this is basically with the same uh, viability assay system but the difference is that I'm um, basically acquiring the uh, signal, which is uh, measuring the, um, the, the cell death in terms of uh, the membrane uh, becoming more and more um, compromised and permeable to the dye. And uh, in this case, I tested them in all three of the uh, the IPG line with uh, out two mutation. And uh, N4K2009 and 2117, as well as 2163, they are, they are a higher concentration, they lead to like really obvious um, cell death. Whereas uh, for most of the compound, it's actually not inducing a lot of uh, any like cell death in the DIBG number four. And and for the DIBG twenty one, I think part of the viability, the efficacy we saw, is probably in terms of uh, inhibiting. Uh, cell pro proliferation. Therefore, mm -hmm. we do not see a um, huge amount of dead cells in here. So basically, mm -hmm. it means that the compounds are inhibiting the cell growth from the in the, uh, from the start of the assay. So we can proceed to the next slide. Mm -hmm. And and over here, uh, uh, I measured uh, with immunofluorescence staining the proliferation of the DIPG cells as well as the apoptosis by using KI67 or the cleave, like path cleavage. And also I, I've counted like the amount of cells based on like the nuclei thing. And um, out of them, unfortunately I've lost the data for the other two cell lines because 
the essay wasn't adapted for those other uh, those other cell lines which are not as as, as human. So okay. I lost them in the process of screening. So these are I'm showing only the results for the IBG number four, which we know is less sensitive to most of the compound. And okay. with in, in yellow or, or, or orange is the uh, M4K2163, which is potent. And over here we can see that it, it reduces the proliferation as well as it, it drastically in uh, increases the apoptosis. So up to like up to 60 to 70 percent of the cells are uh, apoptotic uh, at the end point. And also it drastically uh, suppresses the growth of the cells. Mm -hmm. And this is in, in agreement with the cell uh, viability essay. And I'm in the process of uh, adapting the essay for the other, the IPG cell line. Mm -hmm. okay. So, okay. To so this is, back, sorry, this is confirming really the, the three prioritized compounds we have, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is it telling us about anything else you think that changes our view about the other two and the five that we're moving forward? Or is it just not enough data here? I mean, it reconfirms to me that we got the right three that we're prioritizing, yeah. and it's especially considering the fact that they also could have good uh, brain penetration. penetration. Yeah. So maybe the pharmacokinetics will help it as well. Exactly. I agree. Mm -hmm. okay. I'll have to. I think the data of the other DRPG cell lines with uh, also out two mutation would be uh, informative. I think once I get them, so mm -hmm. it would be good to see how they compare, how they perform in those other DRPG cell lines. Yeah. Awesome. Good. And um, at the moment, I'm also repeating basically the whole panel in more DRPG cell. And this is including uh, another DRPG with uh, out mutation that uh, we've recently uh, revived. And they're growing very really nicely. And um, so, so just to get an idea of how they perform, uh, in, in this particular line, as well as to uh, repeat in a systematic way uh, the effect on the other DIPG cell line. And also uh, me and Alison, we are basic, uh, we are halfway through the uh, cell cycle of profiling of the, of the effect of the compound on the DIPG cell lines with the R2 mutation, as well as um, to quantify in the Western blot and staining the inhibition of uh, smart one five phosphorylase. So yeah, in the, in the near future we should be able to present them. Yeah. Any any questions? No, that's good. Interesting. That's good. It's nice to see you're doing the analysis of all the compounds and comparing them in terms of efficacy, and then looking at the mechanism of this. In the beginning, we always felt like you know the compounds were doing growth arrest. The question is, in addition to that, are you getting apoptosis? And so it's nice to see some of that coming to the fore. Mm -hmm. Yep. Any other questions for Jean Fu? Okay, thanks, Jean Fu. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Okay, so we move on to um, Mehat's presentation. Oops. Yeah, come on in. Oops, okay. Are you kicking me out? It's okay, that's all. And, and feel free to for, just take a moment to remind the team your role and who you are yes, doing. Yeah. Thank you very much. Let everybody know. And feel free to make fun of Max. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Who's Max? Hi, everyone. My name is Mehek Sani. I am a master's student working with the ADMI team at OICR. And today I'd just like to present some data on how we used permeability-based screening tools to predict uh, the BVU penetration of drugs for possibly combination therapy in DIPG. So what we're trying to do with combination therapy, um, I know we're trying to develop the L2 inhibitor as a single agent therapy, but we are looking at exploring its possibility in combination therapy with drugs that are currently in phase one clinical trials. And there's two main reasons for this. The first is to possibly resolve the prevent, uh, and pre prevent or delay the potential development of treatment resistance, which is common with monotherapies in cancer. And second, which is most important, is to possibly improve the efficacy of these compounds because ultimately we're trying to improve patient prognosis. So we are aiming for a synergism, but even additive efficacy would be beneficial. 
The two drug categories that we're interested in are HDAC inhibitors and OSCIL1 NOS. And this is because they're involved with uh, histone mutations that are found in 80% of DIPG, DIPG patients. And these mutations, importantly, co-associate with the ALK2 mutations we're interested in. And so that's why we want to look at these two drug classes. So I know you're familiar with these, but just a background um, refresher. The HDAC inhibitor panobinostat was identified through drug screening and preclinical studies. Um, it is currently in phase one clinical trials for DIPG right now, and last month in mid-February, huh? another trial was... Mm. <laughs> Sorry, I think we're getting some background noise there. I think that's Rima. I think that's Rima, yeah. Because that sounds like a boy. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Okay, um, so last February, um, another clinical trial with panobinostat in prevention in delivery was um, approved with gadolinium for MRI imaging. Um, but what we know about this is there's preclinical evidence that shows treatment resistance has occurred with penicillin. So we are interested in um, looking at if combination therapy could improve this. Any idea what was the outcome of the phase one clinical trial? Was the with HDAC uh, inhibitors deemed to be uh, safe? The, they're currently still all in recruitment phase, as, as far as I far as I know. So no results are posted for those. Og two hundred one, there were results posted. But in a they actually get into the brain. Yeah. So they've got to create these bubbles to break to the blood brain barrier. It's very invasive. It's not a nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so they have to use a specific delivery method, which yeah. is convection enhanced delivery, to get it into the brain. Yeah. So the other drug category that we're interested in is ONC201, which is developed by Oncocytics. Its mechanism of action is kind of here and there. There's a DRD2 and DRD3 antagonist, and it's also known to be a quick B activator. But importantly, it was found to be responsive against um, these histone gliomas, so they carry the H3K27N mutation, which is the important mutation in mm -hmm. DIPG, um, as a positive outlier in the middle of the clinical trial. So because these mutations co-associate with L2, as I'm repeating myself again, um, we're interested in seeing if they would have some synergy or additive effects with L2 inhibitors. Now, this is all great, but of course, the problem we're having with DIPG is the major therapeutic challenge, which is getting it into the brain. So although we might see some in vitro combinational efficacy, it might not translate in vivo that well if one or both compounds cannot get into the brain. So my job or my project was to determine if we can predict using a screening cascade, a permeability-based screening cascade, whether these compounds can penetrate the brain or not. So I know I've shown this model before, but um, to do this uh, screening method, we use the MDCK2 assay, um, which is what I developed in the beginning of my project. And just as a refresher, uh, at OICR, we have two different genetically engineered versions of the cell line. The MDCK2 cell line itself is canine, so it, produces, um, it has the dog wild type PGP in it. And I will use PGP and MDR1 interchangeably. They mean the same thing. Um, at OICR, we have the knockout version of the cell line, which has no PGP transporter. And we also have the knock-in version of the cell line, which has the human PGP transporter expressed only. From this, I can determine the efflux ratio. So this tells me, again, how much of that compound is being removed from the brain relative to each cell line that I have. If I divide these values, I can determine the KI over K ratio, KO ratio, which just tells me how good of a substrate that compound is for PGP. Mm -hmm. So using this and a bunch of other data, which I will show in a second, we were interested in looking at, uh, we selected some compounds and we ran them in the MDCK2 assays. So in panel A here, yeah, in panel A here, we have three HDAC inhibitors. Panel B is three uh, ONC201 analogs. And panel C is the number of L2 compounds that we selected based on the nanobrite assay. So what you're seeing here in blue is the efflux. I know it's cut off, but it's the efflux ratio when there is no transporter present. So um, this is the knockout. In the orange, you are seeing the efflux ratio when the PGP transporter is present. So just as an example, OICR19304 would probably be a really good substrate for PGP because when that transporter is present, more of that compound is leaving the brain compared to when that transporter is not. So we would deem this as a bad compound compared to something like OICR17205 or, yeah, 
well, yes, it's one, which is not affected by that transporter's presence, whether it's there or not. Its efflux remains the same. So this is, yeah, and for K2117. And we would deem this as a good compound. So we just have put this into uh, table form. We rank order the compounds based on the efflux ratio, and the color scheme here does not mean anything definitive. It's just to be able to see the difference between the compounds. Um, we also, I know it's small, but on the right side of this here, we have the KI over KO ratio. So this tells me if that compound is a really good substrate. If it is, we wouldn't test it in vivo. We also made sure that the data corresponded with uh, KCO2 permeability assay, which is, we routinely use at OICR. And then we looked at their efficacy data, clinical significance, and of course their microsomal data to make sure if we run it in vivo, it would be stable. And we selected three compounds from this as candidates. The L2 inhibitor 18714, HDAC inhibitor 20226, and ONC2-1 analog 16618. And these are the structures here. We also selected a positive control that we've run at a CRR before just to make sure our experiments were working the same, which is 17205, and the negative control 17112, which we predicted from our screening cascade that it would not be BBB permeable. So we're using that to basically validate if our predictions are working appropriately. Compound 163, that was really good. Mm -hmm. How does it look here? 16431, the lead compound? Yeah, it's 2163 is almost very similar to 009 in terms of BBB penetration. Mm -hmm. So she just used, yeah, and then she picked another one. I mean, so what she did, she went through all of the after compounds. She has this computation of in silica system. Mm -hmm. So agnostic of what we pick. You know, yeah. let it do the exercise and pick the best compound. So she did that. and. 714 popped out as one that's very interesting. Okay. Yeah. I didn't want to rerun the same compounds yes. that we already run, so we selected some other different ones as well. I'm sorry, which M4K compound is OICR 18704? 18714, the difference is it's flowing here. What number? M4K number. Yeah? It doesn't have an M4K number? It does. It does. I, mean, I don't remember what the is. I can M4K check it for number. you and yeah. give it to you. Is it one of the five leads? No, it's not one of the five leads. Continuing on from the selection, we also checked it in in, in an in silico model, which is Swiss ADME, so it's a web-based model where you input the structure as a smile formation and it gives you a bunch of characteristics. What we're interested in is um, the gut absorption, BBB penetration, and whether it predicts the compound is an MDR1 or PGP substrate or not. So just as an example, looking at the HDAC inhibitors, Using TPSA and WLogP, it gives you something called a boiled egg plot. Depending on the color, it means different things. So the yolk region here um, tells you if the compound is BBB penetrant. If it is white, this area here, um, that compound is expected to be gut permeable. And if it's in the gray area, that means that compound is impermeable altogether. So just looking at the HVAC inhibitors here, you can see 199. 5.6, for example, would be completely impermeable, so we would eliminate that and narrow down our compounds using this. And, of course, the um, in vitro data also corresponded, so just looking back here, 199.56 has the worst uh, efflux ratio compared to the other two compounds in the HDAC inhibitor. So by validating it with the in silico data as well, we went on and did our in vivo um, experiment. So here we have dosed uh, non-skin mice with 10 milligram per kilogram oral dosing and collected their brain tissue and plasma tissue at two hours and four hours. We measured their concentration um, and we calculated their plasma to brain ratio. And you'll notice here that um, I've said all candidates we chose behaved as we predicted. So 17112, which was our negative control, we saw nothing in the brain at all. 17205 is our positive control, and compared to this, 20226, 16618, and 18714 were all deemed BBB permeable. You'll notice that the ratios are quite high for these two compounds, 16618 and 18714. We are doing a total brain homogenate, so we're extracting the compound from the total brain in this uh, experiment. So that could explain why these um, ratios are quite high. But 
Um, although 16618, so the OG201 analog and 18714 have comparable ratios, I would just like to point out that their concentration in the brain is quite different, where 18714, so the ALK2 inhibitor, is about five to seven times higher, depending on the time point you're looking at, compared to 16618. And then the other thing that we wanted to note is, although 20226 has similar in vitro and in silico data, it did not perform as well as the ALK201 analog and the ALK2 inhibitor. And we were trying to figure out why this may be, and during this process, we went back and looked at the IVIVC, so the in vitro and vivo correlation, and we found something um, quite interesting. So just as a reminder, um, here I'm plotting the MDCK2 knock-in um, B to A value. So the B to A value represents how much of that compound is moving from the brain back to the blood. So as that number increases, you're seeing that there's a decrease in the concentration in the brain, which makes sense. More of the compounds leaving the brain, less you would see inside um, the tissue. So we did see a modest correlation, and I know there's only five compounds here, but we've seen similar data with KCO2 with a lot more compounds, where we see a quite nice correlation between the B to A value and the C brain concentration. So that's telling me that this might be a good predictor of in vivo um, BBB permeability of compounds. So, in summary, uh, we use the permeability-based screening cascade to successfully predict the BBB permeability of compounds, regardless of the chemotype. We were also able to identify three compounds that might um, be ideal for studying synergy or um, additive efficacy, so combinational efficacy in vivo. And interestingly, we found that there was a nice correlation between the B to A permeability in vitro and in vivo seabrate concentration. I would like to acknowledge Dr. Alawar and, of course, the ADMI team, Dr. Aman and Dr. Kyoto. Yeah. Any questions Any. you may have? Thank you. Next steps. Next steps. So, the next step would be to make sure that the co dosing of the two compounds is not affecting each other. So, no. if you have an H stack inhibitor and L2 inhibitor together, is that going to inhibit one compound from entering the brain compared to the other if they're using the same, let's say, transporters going in? And how, okay, and how would that experiment be set up? So, actually, I did do a preliminary issue. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, we didn't set this up. Before. No, no, okay. So, um, no, but one thing about the next steps, we have yeah. to be able four months to keep doing some stuff, so yeah. we have to keep moving through that. So, for example, um, here I did the in vitro data. Um, I dosed the same concentration of the compounds. These are the, this is 16431, this is our lead compound here. Um, we dosed it with the ONC201 analog and the HDAC inhibitor and see if the efflux changes. Now, I know you're seeing a little bit of a difference here, but the error bars, it's pretty much negligible. So, for 16431, if you were to dose it with the ONC201 analog and the HDAC inhibitor, I don't think I would see much of a difference. So, they would probably both be able to penetrate the BBB. Yeah. 421 is 2009. 2009, yes. What's 2026? Uh, that is the HDAC inhibitor. Yes. That's the HDAC inhibitor so, from yeah, when, what, what we're trying to do, I mean, we know they are both cross BBB now. What, what she is trying to make sure that they will not impact. One's yeah. clogging the other. Yeah, exactly. yeah, no, no, I so that's, that. the, that's the idea. But these are all in vitro validation. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But we, you know, it's even further more aesthetic would be checking it in vivo, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Co dosing them in vivo and check if they have the same concentration. But right? it's also neat when we get to there to find out if this indicates well when we find out in vivo, I assume it's one of the going records, yeah. obviously. Yeah. So that's um, okay, what's the, so what do you expect? Expect to see. So, I, know that, I know that's not a very scientific question. But so, <laughs> but what do you expect? Do you have any reason to think that one? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. All right, keep going. Oh, okay. Um, okay. So, one eight seven one four was uh, interesting. This is the L two inhibitor. Um, when we dosed it with the ALK two hundred one analog and the H stack inhibitor, its efflux changed quite a bit. Uh, again, these are preliminary, so I would have to validate this once more. But I would expect that, for example, this compound, I know it's not our lead, um, but if we were to dose it, its efflux would increase. So more of that compound would actually end up not being able to get into the brain. But for our lead compound, um, as to 
answer the question, what would you expect with this in vivo? If we were to dose it with the HDAC inhibitor and on one analog, I believe that it wouldn't be affected. So if we were to dose it, its BB penetration should stay the same. So, and you just do this on one time period? One one hour time period. One time, yeah. Is there any reason to do various time periods to find out how quickly this is? Okay. Is, there, is there any scientific reason for doing that? Well, we can. But I guess it's more of an in vivo question. Exactly. Than yeah. Exactly. In vitro. In vitro. I mean, in vivo, that's why we do two hours. Two yeah. Times, yeah. One is two hours and one is four hours. But in vitro, the full assay is set up for one time. Yeah, one point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I get that. Can I give you me for my just ignorance, uh, one huge favor next time we come by to this? Can you put them all down for the M4K numbers to extend? Yes. Yeah. That'd be really Sorry. helpful for me so that I can. The only reason it's OICR is because we don't have M4K numbers for the HDAC and the um, ONC201, yeah. so to keep it consistent, I just kept them all the same. Yeah. But I will definitely keep uh, them. I greatly appreciate it. Yeah. 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 Really, really, really. So I'd like to just sort of, this is really well done. I mean, well, it's really clear. Um, when you're thinking scientifically about this cancer, mm -hmm. um, you've chosen compounds to codose that are basically hand grenades that people selected not on a science basis because at the time this was what they had at hand. Mm -hmm. In oncology, if you look at the last 20 years, the life expectancy gains by small molecules based on the carpet bomb approach have been six months incremental. And what we're hoping is that where more genomics gets inserted into this oncology drug discovery, that will be get better at it because mm -hmm. we're no longer taking the atomic bomb, killing all the cells, and yeah. praying it works. So this is a paradigm of this disease, because of that concept. This is not a disease where accumulated mutations over a lifetime cause the cell to go awry. This is almost like a developmental disease where you have very specific pathways. Mm -hmm. ALK2 is one of them. Yeah. Another one is something to do with epigenetics, obviously, because the K 27N is an epigenetics mark. Mm -hmm. And HDAC, although it's called <laughs> epigenetics, that's an acetyltransferase yeah. inhibitor. It's unlikely to be. So don't get fooled that it's an epigenetics thing. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. It makes no sense scientifically to have HDAC as part of the mix. Have a look and read up, because you know your training. Read up on the pathways that are implicated mm -hmm. in, in, and see if you can find anything, hypothesis that might perturb those pathways as part of your training to figure out, you know, we need to try to invent a new and hopefully more effective and less harmful way of treating cancer based on the science. What how ONC 201 and HDAC got in it because they happen to be at hand. You throw them on cells, the cells die. Well, no shit, Sherlock, right? They're going to die. And so when you're doing these studies in the future, certainly as you're preparing for your comprehensives or whatever exams you have as a part of your training, think about scientifically what you're trying to accomplish. In addition to the technical stuff you're learning, which is awesome, right? And you present really well, well done. Just think about that. Like, how to invent a new way mm -hmm. uh, of doing it. And we're in very perfectly positioned to do that, okay? Got it. Can I ask a quick question? Sorry, um, this is coming from a lawyer, so apologies if it's uh, <laughs> basic, but how correlative of uh, PONS penetration would, would this sort of whole brain approach be? I'm glad you asked that. That is uh, one question that I have um, been working with myself. You so you can see there being differential expression of yeah. deflex pons exactly. versus the rest of the brain. Um, since we're using mouse brain, isolating the pons was extremely difficult. It's quite small, and I am not uh, animal-based uh, scientist, I guess I could say. Um, so it was hard for me to isolate just the pons itself. So right. we did do the whole brain, but um, that would be a very interesting study to do to continue and look at homogenize the ponds itself. Yeah, and there are other ways, like there are other ways people do now bring fix infection and then try to look at the mass imaging kind of techniques. Uh, we, we do not have those access to those techniques, but there are people uh, who are working on those things. We believe there are these differences uh, in, in the pond and the brain, but how much different we don't know. To this is my question when you were talking about that model, model one you have to create those pores for the transplant too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know how it's 
it's efficient to cross all the way to the plant as well. Yeah, I mean, the night gets into the brain, but only if they do imaging with an it actually gets to the plant. I mean, yeah, yeah. Not on that day, they haven't been revealed, but they're not to get pan up in a static group and they have to actually watch it in the Yeah. That's a nice, that's a very nice mm-hmm. uh, technique that we're using. I mean, going through to Alice Connell with the carbon we know it's not an ideal each second. Yeah, mm-hmm. there's, yeah, a lot yeah. of, there's a lot of issues at play here, but it does mm-hmm. give us an interesting side of things that to come and should someone get on an H stack inhibitor that is improved in this yeah. way, it could be. I mean, another, I mean, yeah, it could be like, I mean, so some of this still is kind of a follow up. What's the name? Michelle Mine, I mean, that's stuff that here. Produced with a uh, proteasome inhibitor, and maybe they're all capital from stuff. But she went through that whole screening with the IPT lines and looking for kind of clinical compounds that might seem as a hinge for me. So they say the lack of therapy, people are saying things. And we only pick two or one because actually it started creating out of the hoopla. It's one of the compounds they're giving to some patients and the patients had response to me. Nobody understands mechanistically, so you know, that is right. I mean people need to understand mechanistically how these compounds are working but with the absence of anything good. You know, people are trying things out. You know, when we met with the clinicians that's one of the things they brought up. They were actually doing a trial on that one. Oh, oh, this compound is looking really good in the kit. So we just decided, you know, as part of our uh, portfolio of screening. No, I don't think it's a bad idea to improve. But remember, yeah. when you're at every clinic, it happens all the time for 20 years. Yeah. It looks good, looks good. And then you take a big step back and yeah. say, wow, oncology drugs extend lives four months. Mm-hmm. Right? And so it's not the game changing thing we want to happen. Mm-hmm. Right? And it's because we keep doing all the same things over again. We have we're doing the same thing as everybody else. So mm-hmm. we've got to at least intellectually try yeah. to try to make a complete shift in how we treat these things. Mm-hmm. Try anyway. Mm-hmm. Right? We're gonna be forced not to, as Owen says, the regulators say, Okay, that's cool, but show me the old stuff. And then you say, Well, it's only I've been four months. But anyway, we've got to do it anyway. We've got to construct an animal model that works, but that doesn't work, but do it anyway. I mean, it's very... Exactly. We'll be pushing against the rope, but at least keep pushing. Exactly. Okay. All right. All right. Thanks, Thanks very much. Thanks, Thanks. 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 Very good. Before the next one. Thank and you. next time, make sure you make fun of Max. Me? What are you Thank you, man. <laughs> uh, okay, so up next is um, the IP analysis. Um, so it's easy to do this. Yeah. 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 Is greatly appreciated. Okay, so my name is Leah McGurn, and this is Annette, and um, we are U of T law students who are doing an externship, um, helping out with M4K. Um, I have a science background. Annette has kind of a science background. Biochemical background. <laughs> we still consider biochemical. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're okay for now, anyway. <laughs> I'm a finance person, so I'm the first one. <laughs> okay, um, so we did our IP search based on these five lead compounds. Just a reminder of what they all look like. Um, so this um, freedom to operate search is really based on these. So we've heard a lot about a lot, bunch of different compounds, but they have different structures than our freedom to operate search may not um, apply. Um, so we use Marcus structures um, to generate a list of um, potential patent publications. So we did a started with, uh, about 15 different search Marcus structure searches just to sort of see what the patent landscape was, and we chose these as kind of a balance between um, efficiency, but also trying to figure out what would be real world, what would potentially be real world um, problems from the patent literature, and we started with. These two Marquez structures. Everyone knows what a Marquez structure is. It's basically a way of um, notating like a class of chemical compounds, and they're very common in patents. 
to claim like a range of chemical structures. Um, so we started with these two, and we generated the list of about uh, 110 patents, and then we were able to cut it down based on time to uh, 190 or sorry 96, and then we did a quick skim through those. So anything that so like we have in all of our light lead compounds, we have our groups here. So say we had four, it was required four our groups on sort of this background structure and if there was no possibility of only having two that would be eliminated at that stage or if in some of these background structures there was patents that required um, fused ring structures those were eliminated I've seen a couple of those in our other compounds so again <laughs> wouldn't work for this um, and then we got that got us close to 16 patents where we fully read through and did a careful search of and we got to sort of three I'm going to four really fat patent families. The first two are these Harvard patent families that were flagged before. Um, and these were flagged in, I think, December of 2017. Uh, it may have been Max presenting. Um, so since then, these Harvard patent applications have gone abandoned. So they only ever entered national phase in Japan, the United States Patent Office, and the European Patent Office. Um, but in all those cases, all six um, have been abandoned. Okay, that's good information. Do you have any view about why they were abandoned other than just lack of interest? I mean, I know that Formula One's claim scopes, and that's like, that's an awfully broad scope. Well, universities will, especially places like Harvard, will file a bunch of patents, and then some of them will decide to just let last because they don't have attractive capital or whatever it is. Because, yeah. I mean, the, you know, you file and there's a often a four or five year process of getting them issued and you can make decisions in there but which ones to let go. And that's what happened here it looks like. Yeah, the reasons we saw were actually just failure to reply to an office action, um, a communication from the patent office, um, failure to request examination, so it just it appeared to be a lack of interest. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, no, 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 no. I have the bills to prove that. <laughs> the other thing that we should note is um, before when we were looking at the Harvard patents, we didn't have this four methyl group on the backbone purity yeah. structure. So um, this would actually, this is present in all of your current lead compounds, and that four methyl group would take us outside of the claims of the Harvard patents anyway. Mm -hmm. So they're abandoned, but we should be good on a. Uh, to max some. So the compound that may have kicked out with the flow, we actually looked at that compound earlier, somebody asked, and we felt like the methyl was actually cleaner at than the flow. So we ended up prioritizing the methyl. So, but if we need to really go back, if that flow compound continues to look stellar, yeah. I mean, you know, can always go back to it. In terms of new patent applications that were identified in our search, uh, this, these are two related applications, very similar in, in terms of the content for antiviral and antifungal agents, and they um, belong to Ohio State Innovation Foundation, that's a department of Ohio State University, and Academia Sinica is a research institute in Taiwan. Uh, the PCT applications have gone abandoned. The only pending application is a Taiwanese application that originated at the same time as the PCT applications were filed. Um, so they have a deadline coming up in August of this year, and if they fail to uh, reply by the time, or sorry, request examination is what needs to be done by that time, then that application will also be deemed to be abandoned. Um, in terms of the claim scope we have here, Formula One represents the claimed compound in these applications. It's very broad, um, as you'll see on the next slide. Um, and then a sample of the disclosed compounds. So you'll see in the actual application that the compounds that they're contemplating here tend to be much larger and much more complex than the M4K leads, um, which is why I've included that there. Um, we do have at least one lead compound that is a, in terms of the five that we displayed at the beginning of the presentation, um, which falls outside the scope of the claims altogether. Um, so this is, for example, M4K2009. This, a similar analysis would apply to, and I've listed them above, 2163, 2234, and 2236. Um, 
So I've identified here the elements of this here, Formula One claimed compound, as they map onto the M4K 2009 um, lead. And I'll go through this sort of briefly. The boxes represent the, def the definition provided for the variable elements in the claimed compound. So here we have R1 can be any of those elements. In this case, I've underlined uh, the one that corresponds to the lead compound, so that's the alkyl group. R2 here is that last um, defined variable, the aniline nitrogen of structural formula one. R2 and R3 together form an optionally substituted heterocyclic group, and that's uh, identified in the dashed box. AR is, in this case, an optionally substituted aryl group. Uh, this is a complicated one, but again, it underlines sort of what applies to the M4K lead. In short, um, the claimed compound here, Formula One, would map on to four of the five leads. Um, at least it appears so at this point. However, sorry, I'll skip through this. M4K2117 um, falls outside of the scope of the claimed compound because of the absence of this aniline nitrogen. Um, so the sort of NR2, R3 group that I have on the side here represents an element of the claimed compound and it's that nitrogen that we're lacking in this case, which would take M4K2117 outside of the claimed compound altogether. But on that claimed compound, the, the pattern itself has been abandoned, right? Except in Taiwan. Except in Taiwan. Yeah. So we're largely unconcerned. Yeah. Um, we'll keep an eye on the Taiwanese patent application. If worse comes to worse, and um, What's the deadline for it being becoming abandoned? It was an August 2020 deadline to request examination, after which it becomes abandoned or deemed withdrawn. So it's pretty. It's highly unlikely that it's going to be defended, considering that it's Ohio University of Ohio. Do you say Ohio, Ohio State? State. Yeah, but if you don't have the U.S. market for a patent for a compound, you don't have an economic asset. It's hard to see why they would pursue it. So why would they, yeah, exactly, they're just going to let this thing lapse. So I have a dumb question. That's good news for us. Okay. <laughs> so I got a dumb question. Can we take proactive steps to match us to an abandoned patent, i.e. put out some claim or comment that says we actually fall, instead of being passively saying, hoping that some future reviewer agrees with this analysis, and it's great analysis, I know, can you proactively state that we have created a compound or a series of compounds that falls within someone else's patent that has been abandoned, and therefore you are proactively um, uh, making it impossible for anyone to patent your compound because it's an abandoned compound? I don't know whenever it seems to do that. I'm not aware of anyone doing it. But is there some proactive step to publish our patents based upon this original patent? Of course, we do this in November or September 2020. And say, and we attach it to an abandoned patent. Well, one, one thing to note here is that the M4K compounds themselves are not explicitly described in that patent specification. They just fall within the same. No, 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 what you're going to say, somebody could still file a patent later, later yeah. claiming the narrow, like the, the M4K specific compounds. It's called a selection patent. So that can be done. The, the thing that's going to prevent that's what I'm trying to avoid. What can, okay, go ahead. Finish. Yeah, no, the thing that's going to prevent that is just getting the M4K compounds into the literature. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. process. I don't know where we are now. I mean, okay. Yeah, well, I mean, the fact that they're published online is all, is a publication. It's just a question of whether an examiner would find it or not. Yeah. So really what you want to do is get it into a public database um, and publish. If you can publish a paper, um, I, I think that the the databases that the examiners use probably capture or even things in bioarchive now. So just get the stuff out there. And, and that's going to prevent anybody else from filing future claims. All the patents we're looking at here were, were filed before and before case started putting its it's compounds into the public domain. So we have a publication that you will. So but is there, a is there a mechanism to get it into the patent system? Get, getting a CAS number will help too. Yeah. Get a CAS number for the molecule. Okay. That, that will help them to be uh, searchable by the patent office. We should have one for 2009 because yeah. that was done, but any other ones should go into, I think the place is PubChem. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So you're you're basing no specific action to attach to that, other than just going into the public domain and making it as public as possible to attract the attention of reviewers. Yes, I don't, I don't think there's a formal mechanism for associating anything we're doing associating anything we're doing with a, a patent filing in some other jurisdiction or, or even. It's highly unlikely they would have seen that economic reason to do it before us. Did you ever get to follow up that guy who went to the database? He was kind of wanted to send him some information to him. No. So I think that would give them cast numbers too. So maybe that's something. Yeah, let's, let's follow up on that. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Uh, let's see. We don't publish anything, and then someone fired those uh, because we have recording. Can we uh, send this to the patent office? Oh, this has been published before. This is this recording uh, is approved. Yeah. Yeah. So in, in most jurisdictions, there's a mechanism just for third parties to send prior art to a patent office okay. and say you should be aware of this. Sometimes that only happens after patents been granted. Yeah. So it's better if we can get it in sources that the patent examiners will proactively search. Yeah. So they will search PubChem and, yeah. and, yeah. and literature sources. So that's the best way to do it, and then it gets cut off the path. The, the principal problem with what the, the approach you're suggesting is that requires monitoring yeah. of, of mm -hmm. patent literature. Yes. Um, and it's, it's not that easy to do, right? So you have to identify this before a patent issues in the first place. So the last um, patent family that we wanted to flag is this heteral compounds as BTK inhibitors and uses thereof. This is a Merck patent, um, and the bottom line is it's not infringing. Yes? I don't want to make this previous conversation. What if we filed a patent upon these compounds, and it was a patent that was obviously going to get shot down? Yes, that will get you into the patent system, and I think sometimes people take that approach. They'll file a provisional. But it's so we can even refer to this other one and make such a bad case. Or I don't know what you do. But well, you, no, you, can file a, you can file a very good patent and then abandon it, and then it's in the mm -hmm. system. Yeah. But, but, but we also say we don't file patents. I mean, that's part of our, uh, our operating right. That's part of our model. Yeah. Right, so. Finding the No, 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 no. Put something in there. I just want to make sure it's <laughs> in the system. And because things do get missed. And you know, come we'll come and go. My suggestion is that if you're going to go to the trouble of filing a patent, just file, just publish something. Yeah. yeah. It's the same yeah. effort, mm -hmm. and it's going to be found the same way. Yeah, maybe we should go to one follow up with the, uh, like I said, the guy who wants to do database. I mean, get over the one who flat us and tell us this is a good place to just put things out there. The guy you're asking us, I mean, do you want to go to the next step? So, I mean, I was hoping that, you know, but you probably very good. Okay. Well, 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 no, no, I think it's a good point because. This is going to require, like, you, it's better even still if you put the, the compound and some data in there suggesting yeah. what it does, because also what you're doing by doing that is preventing somebody from filing use claims yeah. from, from things like that, right? So, from methods of synthesis, if you happen to be able to put that in the public domain as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, I think it's a scientist that probably should, you know, be involved in putting, putting the, the compound structure in and the data sets and, and all of that that at least even summary data on what it does. Mm -hmm. um, so let's let's follow up on that and make sure that gets yeah. in wherever, whatever uh, database makes yeah. sense. Okay. Okay, so um, as you can see, this is Merck patent. This has gone into uh, the national phase in 21 jurisdictions, including Canada, the US, and Europe. Um, the U.S. patent was issued in June 2019, and the, uh, there's been a request for examination of this patent in Canada in November 2019. Um, and as you can see, it's a pretty broad Merkesh structure. In the U.S., the patent claims were slightly narrowed. Um, there were some um, issues that I won't get into now, but uh, what I really want to focus is on these two R groups. Um, at least one of these has to be either a cyano group or this, this group here. And um, as you can see, for our compounds, we don't we don't meet that claim. Mm. So basically, our compounds should fall with, outside of the claims of this patent. Okay. Okay. I think that's everything we wanted to flag. 
Any questions? Any other questions? That's good. So the top line is we have complete freedom on these molecules yes. except in Taiwan. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right now. Right now. That's important. In August we might have to move. Yes. Yeah. Right. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. We're doing intelligence. You know, it's an ongoing process. So. But thank you a lot for doing that. It's really, really useful. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, so yeah, so I guess that that was it for the list of presentations we had today and updates. Um, if there aren't any other burning questions and stuff for the team, is there any other thing that people would like to discuss? If not, I think that brings the meeting to an end. Well, just to summarize a couple of things, our main programs that are going on right now are around the uh, in vivo work. Yes. And uh, and uh, some of the other work that uh, we're going to probably do up at um, in, in at Oxford. Mm -hmm. um, the timing for the in vivo study results are probably not going to be timely for a April meeting. Mm. Is that correct? Yes. I think we're going to cancel. We're going to so I'm just saying that for the record. I think it might be since we won't have uh, anything overly interesting. Yeah. Uh, maybe we skip the April meeting and go straight to the May meeting. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and do, do you know what dates for so all to say for the people on the line, et cetera, um, obviously we can have uh, offline conversations, but we will probably skip, unless notified otherwise, the April meeting and go straight to the May meeting, mm -hmm. followed by a June and July meeting. July, yeah. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, because by the time we should, like, um, Owen said, we're hoping to have some in vivo data. I think we'll have some exciting stuff to chat about yeah. then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's good. Okay. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. All right. Good time. Cheers. Thanks. Thank you.